part of this is going to be a review from cut flower chrysanthemums because it's the same genus and species. So we'll skip some of this other than it's up there. But uh, since 1940, uh, most, of the cut, uh, most of the chrysanthemum breeding has been focusing on uh, potted materials, materials grown in uh, containers or fall mums. Now the typical florist chrysanthemum is sold for pot culture only. And uh, they don't do well as a uh, garden mum. The potted chrysanthemums that are sold as garden mums uh, are bred for outdoor planting. They're hardy, uh, maybe semi-hardy. They're typically grown as a herbaceous crop. For instance, I have hard, a hardy mum planted in my front flower bed that I didn't have been expected to live, and it's been there for four years now. So it's, all right, so garden mums are, are typically grown for outdoor planting, they're hardy, semi-hardy, they're herbaceous. Um, they're expected to come back year after year, uh, but oftentimes they don't. If you were to plant the, the traditional florist mum, the mum that you buy at a florist shop, as a blooming plant for uh, a gift or something, don't expect it to survive in the landscape. I'm not going to say it won't, because the first time I say something won't happen, it will like the football stadium. Um, I could have sworn it would never happen. But um, we've already talked. No, it may not ever happen. <laughs> it may not ever happen. <laughs> That's true. It may not ever happen. It's a composite inflorescence. The flowers structure is actually a capitulum. And each of the individual disc flowers and ray flowers represent the, um, the f uh, flower cluster itself. And then the flower head or the capitulum is born on a structure called a cyme or a cymos cluster. Composites, uh, the disc flowers, the ray flowers are uh, shown here. They're somewhat uh, different. Um, the flat bisexual sour fl uh, flowers are the ray flower or disc flowers, and they're in the middle. And the ray flowers, which have the elongated petals, are the rays. We've already talked about the singles, cultivar, different cultivars. Um, there are hundreds of cultivars available for pot forcing. Uh, the breeders look for a well-shaped plant that branches readily, flowers quickly on short stems so we don't have to use a uh, whole lot of plant growth regulators. And they're looking for unique flowers in different shapes and sizes. The singles or the daisy form, probably the most common. We have the singles and quilled. Anemones. You can see where the single has uh, more of a um, cushion type. Spiders kind of frilly, like anemones, but they're all long and tubular. Pom-poms, often called button mums. Decoratives. And of course, the larger flowered ones. Typically, the larger flowered ones, uh, like the Fujis and the spiders, are not grown as pot mums, but grown as cut flowers. There are two different uh, growth practices we use. There's the standard where they're grown as a single stem and the lateral buds are removed and that's traditionally for the cut mums. In the pot mums we usually use a spray practice where we're looking to produce the plant as a multi-stemmed plant. We're removing the terminal bud and allow that um, lateral bud to develop. So. We want the lateral buds to stay, and we want to remove that terminal buds. Remember, it's a cymos cluster, and a cymos cluster means that they, um, the top, topmost bud develops and blooms first, and the rest of them bloom in sequence. By taking the terminal bud out, that dominance is broken, and they all tend to bloom at the same time. Or they could be grown as a disbud which is typically more towards the um, 
cut mum style, but some people will disbud like this. And this all has to be done by hand. Propagation of mums, they're available as rooted or unrooted cuttings. Uh, most growers bring in rooted cuttings because that way you don't have to have propagation space. Uh, if you're going to get in unrooted cuttings, you need to root them in high humidity with intermittent mist. Um, air temperature 70 to 85, uh, growth medium temperature, your root zone 70 to 74, and they need to be grown with 3,200 to 3,800 foot candles of light, and they need a night break or long days because it's still photoperiodic plant. We need to grow the plant vegetatively at this point because we don't want the plant to root and bloom at the same time. Potting soil, um, media for, for propagation. A lot of people grow in cells or flats, rock wool foams. Uh, we stick them in one inch or so. Uh, rooting hormone um, helps with uh, a little bit of, uh, to help your rooting callus form more quickly. And as soon as we start to see callus and roots develop, that's when we want to hit them with fertilizer. Some growers, a lot of growers use the direct stick method where they're taking the unrooted cuttings and sticking them in their final container. This is uh, a, a big step in reducing labor. However, it requires a larger propagation space. And if you lose one cutting in a pot, if you've got three to five cuttings, all of a sudden you've depleted the marketability of that one pot. Um, So here's an example of propagating or sticking cuttings in to foam cubes. And I know these are poinsettias, but it's what I could find <laughs> in my picture collection. When we pot the plants, we pot the rooted cuttings, we want a coarse, well-drained mix. Um, chrysanthemums do not tolerate wet, soggy soil, but it needs to have a high moisture holding capacity high cation exchange capacity, pH 5.7 to 6.2. And we're going to bring that up with dolomitic limestone. And it's best to go ahead and make sure they have superphosphate and your other microelements blended in the potting soil before you transplant. If you're putting multiple stems per pot, you want to make sure that all the, sti all the cuttings are um, the same height. You want to go for uniformity. Otherwise, you're going to have an uneven plant at finishing. You can compensate this in part by pinching, by using hard pinches and soft pinch combinations, but oftentimes that still results in uneven growth. So you might grade them into three different categories, short, thin stems, not very well rooted, average, and then tall, thick, medium rooted, and you're going to handle those. For instance, item number three, tall, thick stems, you probably pinch them hard. Short, thin stem, you probably pinch them soft. Average, you may not pinch them at all until later. That way you have a uniform crop coming off the same bench at the same time. Because when you order in cuttings from a, from a propagator, oftentimes you have to sort and grade what they send you. Now we want these pretty shallow. We want the roots just barely covered. And we want to plant close to the rim. And we want to lean the cuttings out away from the center of the pot at a 45 degree angle. And what this does is gives us a bigger appearance in our plant. The medium should be moist when we plant into it. Uh, it's not good to plant into dry media because it's hard to wet it. And by the time you get the potting soil wet, you're going to wash the cuttings up because we planted them sh shallow. We want to water them twice after we transplant. The first time, we want to water it with clear water to push the soil through and get a wetting front established in the container. And the second one, for our rooted cuttings, we want to start our fertility program right away. Mums are somewhat of a heavy feeder at this point. So an example of our container, I want to plant them in at an angle, 45 degrees. And the idea is so that they, they grow outward from the container, and they will then um, make a fuller plant. There we go. So 
my artwork. Um, take it. <laughs> so that way we, we get a fuller plant. And this is why when you're looking at containers, and there are different patterns. You know, this is four. Sometimes they'll put a fifth one in the middle if this is a six and a half. A six inch pot, they'll do four or three, depending on the cultivar. Um, get in eight, nine inch pots. If it's a garden mum, they'll typically do one because they're a larger, more aggressive plant. So here is some um, standards, a three inch pot, one cutting per pot. We're gonna space them in the greenhouse, five inches on center. Four inch pot up to six inch pot. That's four to five cuttings per pot. What controls the number? It's the cultivar, how vigorous of a grower it is. And ideally, we're gonna put those on 12 inch centers. So you can tell right away the value of how much it's going to cost. This is going to cost, it's going to be a bigger pot, more soil, more cuttings, more space. This is, you want to sell this as a premium. Oftentimes these smaller, that's what we're using for little gift baskets or something like that the florist will use to put together uh, smaller displays. Just depends on the market that you're trying to touch with your crop. Newly transplanted pots, and a lot of growers will have two different locations for their chrysanthemums. They'll grow their, their they'll do their transplant, their cuttings, they'll move it into a greenhouse where everything is, is uh, planted pot to pot, touching each other, and it's gonna be a, maybe a heavily shaded greenhouse, a little bit of uh, intermittent mist, and we're gonna keep them at pot to pot until it's time to pinch. And the time to pinch typically is when the leaves start to touch each other. Uh, pot to pot spacing in this particular stage gives us conserved greenhouse space that helps us to uh, keep our humidity uh, and reduces the area that we have to have for extended photo period or lights. At this point, uh, they like lots of fertilizer, 212, 3 to 400 parts per million nitrogen um, from balanced feed and um, we do this until the roots reach the bottom of the pot. So the roots are gonna grow out first, hit the edge of the pot, and grow to the bottom of the pot. When the roots hit the bottom of the pot, then we're gonna back off to 200 to 250 parts per million. So the grower has to pay attention. And it's usually at this particular point, somewhere around there, they're gonna think about moving the plants and pinching. Electrical conductivity of our potting soil, 1.5 to 2. We don't wanna get it higher than 2.5. And again, maintain the pH 5.8 to 6.2. Fertilizers high in ammonium. Uh, we can get up to, we can go up to 40% ammonium in our fertilizer during the vegetative stage when it's warm. When it's cool, if the soil is cool or we're not heating our soil, we need to keep the ammonium levels low. Now after we uh, start to, to move our plants out of the um, establishment stage, the roots have fully formed in the potting soil. We're gonna cut our fertilizer to about 125 to 150 parts per million again when we see the flower buds starting to form. We stop fertilizers three to four weeks before we finish it because there's enough nutrients in the flower itself to finish the crop. And if we continue to flower, add fertilizers as the flower is developing, we reduce the quality of the bloom and we also reduce the shelf life of the product in the home. So we wanna start cutting back on the fertilizer and start starving it a little bit. Um, we don't wanna let them go dry. Um, maybe slightly dry in between each watering. Uh, we wanna water to full saturation, the recommendation is 10 to 15% leachate. Um, if we're gonna go to a no leach practice or to a sub-irrigation practice through ebb and flood, we're gonna cut that down to 50 to 100. And uh, most growers with mums try to avoid hand watering because hand watering with mums is, gives a very inconsistent, um, irregular watering practices and it's better to use an emitter in each container to have uniform watering with trickle tubes or sub-irrigation. Actually, the best mums are grown that I've ever seen are always grown in sub-irrigation. 
So here's an ebb and flood greenhouse floor where you can see newly transplanted mums. These are on one foot center. And this is uh, an ebb and flood floor. And as they, this is uh, later in the season. And this is in the season where we're getting ready to bloom out that crop. Potted mums, when we're past the establishment stage, we're in the production stage, they require lots of light. Uh, southern growers uh, will use a little bit of shade, but it's important that you have clear, good light. And um, if you have an old beater greenhouse that's got lots of shade that doesn't have a lot of good light, like an old fiberglass house or something like that, you may have to increase your spacing to get good development. Now we're going to pinch our mums to get full development. We're going to do a, uh, to get our lateral branching and get a bigger flower count. And um, we don't typically use a schedule like we do with mum, uh, with poinsettias. We do it based on their growth. So the growers have a team that work with the plants and they know when to pinch based upon um, the growth size. And we typically start once the uh, root system has hit the bottom of the pot, and they should have three quarters to an inch of new growth on that cutting. And uh, we're going to take a half to three quarters of an inch, allowing six to eight leaves to remain on that, so we get six to eight branches on each cutting. Spacing depends on your pot size, uh, six to six and a half, which is a, one of the standard production practices. Now, a production practice that some growers used to do is they would grow a six, uh, grow a five to five and a half inch pot, and um, it, it's no longer an accepted practice. But they would try to mark it as a six to six and a half, or they would take the six to six and a half and grow it on the five to five an inch spacing and use more growth regulators. But this is one of the things where you start looking at how good of a quality in which your market is. If you're going for the box store market, you might lean towards this spacing. If you're going for the premium florist market, you might go to this spacing. Okay? So the, the premium florist market is probably looking at these for funeral sales and such as that. Whereas the box store market is looking for um, more of a uh, impulse buy. So here's an example of uh, some mums being grown. This is a greenhouse in Montgomery, Alabama. And you can see the staging of how th this particular grower is growing their crops. And those are all on one foot spacing. Photo period, they're obligate short day plants. Uh, plants flower when the day length is shorter than the critical day length. That means if we're going to bloom our mums year round, we have to have some way to provide a dark period. There are two photo, critical photo periods. One is the initiation period and is the flower development. And these are all based upon the response group. And the response group is cultipar dependent. Here's some older cultivars. Uh, for instance, the white wonder is a six week response group. Now that six weeks refers to how much time it is from flower initiation to anthesis. So the, for instance, here we see the critical the photo period. It's got to have 16 hours of dark, but for development, it's 13.75 hours of dark. And you can see how the response groups change. You go down to snow, 11 weeks, or 11 hours, at, but it's a 15-week response group. So they kind of run together that the longer the response group, the um, shorter the photo period is. Not really something a hard and fast rule, but it tends to run in that trend. So with your scheduling of your night interruption, for instance, January, you might need four hours per night. But in July, you only need two hours per night, depending on your latitude. And this particular graph is actually uh, from a textbook written by Roy Larson. And it was his uh, latitude when he wrote this chart was North Carolina.
So it, it's going to vary. We use 60 watt bulbs, uh, that's all it needs, incandescent bulbs, to control our photo period. Artificial short days, uh, March 21st to September 21st, we need black cloth. Um, night temperature, long days to develop the plant size, a leaf unfolding rate. Is it linear with temperature? Up to about 68. Um, then it decreases above 75. And in fact, we'll have flower delay if we get over 85. Short days, the optimum temperature is um, we can't speed this or slow the flowering time like we can control the leaf unfolding rate. That is genetically um, locked into the plant based upon uh, the plant genetics and not based upon temperature. Now, we're going to decrease it again when the plant is showing color and even more so during the last two weeks. And what that drop in temperature does on a chrysanthemum is it intensifies that the flower color, and it improves the vase life or the shelf life of the plant in the home. Heat delay is a problem. Uh, so some cultivars are resistant. Uh, we can control that so much uh, as by reducing our, our light intensity. But the challenge is with heat delay is in the midsummer months when we're pulling black cloth, that under that black cloth it gets very hot. So what some growers try to do is they try to uh, extend the black cloth earlier in the day, uh, you know, like pull it late in the afternoon or late early in the evening when it's not so hot and the sun's not so intense, and then extend it in the morning as long as they can to avoid heat buildup under the black cloth. So that's the challenge. Carbon dioxide uh, up to about a thousand parts per million will help plant growth, especially in the um, vegetative uh, stage. It, it can reduce our time in the vegetative stage. It has no impact on bloom time. So like with most crops, you start uh, at the finish at the harvest point and work backwards to where you want to do your, where you want to start your plant. So everything will be worked backwards in our planning. Disc budding, uh, we do that uh, primarily taking the center bud out um, to give more lateral branching. Uh, multiple bud removal, uh, that's usually on a second pinch. Most growers try to avoid it because it just adds more labor to their crop. Height control, uh, growers use everything from diff. Uh, chrysanthemums respond very well to diff. Uh, the standard growth regulators, uh, B9 and Psychocell tank mix, like we use with poinsettias, works very well, uh, depending on how vigorously the plants are growing in the time of year. ARS, Bonsai, Sumagic, they're all labeled for chrysanthemums, but chrysanthemums are very sensitive to it, and it needs to be done with uh, a little bit of experimenting before you do it on a full fridge, because it's going to vary from year to year. With these high-end, very hot growth regulators like ARS, Bonsai, and Sumagic, it's important that you keep a log book and good data so that you could look at it. And the data you need to have includes how bright the lights, how many cloudy days, was it cold outside, was it warm outside, were the cuttings any good when they came in. These kinds of things are going to impact. And you start to start uh, having to put these things together and be a good grower by learning from your mistakes. Post-harvest handling, maintain high levels until the final three to four weeks. We're going to start um, to back stuff down. Um, we want to keep our ammonium levels low. Start, stop fertilizer at, at, uh, before the blooms are finished, and they'll stay longer and be better. So here's a little chart of when to ship your, your, um, your chrysanthemums. This is at stage one of bloom. You can see that. Uh, the petals are standing upright. They're at attention. And that's stage one, bloom. Stage two, we have one quarter, a quarter to a third of our flowers are fully open. 
Stage three is half open. Stage four, two thirds to fully open. Where would you think could be best to ship your plants? What happens a lot of times if it's stage one, they won't get much past stage one when they hit the garden center or the florist shop and then go into the consumer's hands. Stage four, well, they look great coming off the bench. They look fantastic in the florist shop. When it gets home, the vase life and shelf life with the consumer is very short. Stage five, we want to avoid shipping at that point at all. Ideally, we want to ship our mums at stage two to stage three so that when they get to the retailer, they're pushing stage three to stage four. So when they get to the consumer, they're at stage five. Stage five is a happy consumer. Happy consumer buys again. 